Gracious Lord, in speaking about the sealing, Lord, we're talking about a work that you do. And it's only through our complete submission that you can achieve the sealing of your people who claim you, who follow you. We ask that our Savior's love and spirit of submission would be imparted to each one of us. And that our hearts and minds would be stayed on thee as never before. For the sealing is that act that takes place that provides that security, that protection for the days that are turbulent before the return of Jesus. I pray, Father, that we will study, commit ourselves to all that we will learn, and that may the words that are spoken be reflective of your intent. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we have been on this journey for several weeks, and so we're, let's do a quick recap. Let's do, do a quick recap of where we are and really how we got here. And let's start at the beginning. We began with a scriptural study in God's assessment process of humanity's character. So that's where we started. So we proved the fact that the Lord knows. And so while we may not know someone, and we might think that we are all right before God, that in truth, God knows our characters. And so we looked at a series of scriptures to deal with God's view of humanity without the intervention of a redeemer. So it proved that man needs a redeemer, all right? Man needs a redeemer. So that's a that's a that's a just a brief list. That's an abbreviated list, if you will, of passages that share what the Bible says about humanity and that without Christ, we cannot be saved. So no matter how good we are and how people think we're good, this gives us just a snapshot of God's view of humanity. Now, let me encourage you to always remember that you can receive this sermon in its entirety. I will share it with our, our team, and they will provide it in our weekly e-news next week, and that will be available next Thursday. If you want it sooner, just email the pastor, Pastor T. Don't forget the T, Pastor T. A H C at gmail.com. So we learned about man's condition. Humanity needs salvation. So Born in sin, humanity's understanding is darkened, his heart is full of evil, his heart is spiritually dead. Man's only solution is Jesus, to look to God, to believe in the good news offered by Christ, to believe in the Holy Scriptures, to look for Christ's return. Those are four critical points in Christ. So man's need in his desire for completeness and contentment. So how shall we live? We must live like we belong to Christ. And we looked at several quotations, all right? Jesus stand in the Holy of Holies, now to appear in the presence of God for us. He ceases not to present his people moment by moment, complete in himself. But because we are thus represented before the Father, we are not to imagine that we are to presume upon his mercy. So we, can, we cannot take the approach of saying the Lord will understand and it will be okay and he knows my weaknesses. We can't make excuses. I thought Sister Rose did a beautiful job this morning of emphasizing the fact we cannot live on excuses, all right? We're not to imagine we are to presume upon his mercy and become careless, indifferent, and self-indulgent. Christ is not the minister of sin. We are complete in him, accepted in the beloved, only as we abide in him by faith, all right? So then we... We began by laying out how we receive the seal of God. And that's John 6, 25 through 27. All right. So now let's continue. As Christ is our example, since he is sealed, we are to be sealed. 
And I believe that there are a few questions requiring an answer. And so this passage that we just looked at in John 6, 25 through 27 said that Christ was sealed. Why was Christ sealed by the Father? Since our Heavenly Father sealed Christ, what qualified him to be sealed and are the same standards or measures expected of us? If there is a connection between John 6 and Revelation 7, which the Greek word establishes clearly, then how do we achieve it? If there are expectations, are they written or implied? So we then focused on connecting scriptural requirements, the character of Christ and the carnal mind, inevitably conflicting with divine expectations. For Seventh-day Adventists, for Seventh-day Adventists, I didn't stumble through with our own, our own denomination's name. Forgive me for that. For Seventh-day Adventists, the challenge is even more compelling. Why is it more compelling? Well, note this. Though Christ humbled himself to become man, the Godhead was still his own. His deity could not be lost while he stood faithful and true to his loyalty. Surrounded with sorrow, suffering, and moral pollution, despised and rejected by the people to whom he had been instructed, who had been entrusted the oracles of heaven, Jesus could yet speak of himself as the son of man in heaven. He was ready to take once more his divine glory when his work on earth was done. Now, note what's underlined. The larger portion of those who upon these spirit special occasions were forced to see that he was the son of God refused to receive him. Their blindness corresponded to their determined resistance of conviction. That is a critical point. The ceiling will never fall on or be given to anyone who is resistant to submitting to Christ as truth is revealed. We must be clear on that. Christ reveals in his word what he expects of us. The Holy Spirit reveals to us where our characters are. And in any place that we fail to submit or surrender to those revelations, to that experience, it to those uh, divine instruction or to that divine instruction of what God is showing us, he can't seal us because to seal us at that point would be sealing a rebellious person. And if he sealed a rebellious person, he'd have to go back and apologize to the, to the devil, okay? So how do, we, how do we pull that or how do we prove that in scripture? This issue of spiritual vision. And the reason we don't see ourselves as rebellious is because we're spiritually blind. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 talks about that. Blindness is due to Ill, uh, influences, spiritual, familial, which is family, relational, and values. And then we have blindness due to rejection of truth. Let me share this with you. The more we reject truth, the blinder we become. The more we reject truth, the blinder we become. So when we reject the truth at any level, whether it's God talking to us on a personal level or whether he's speaking to us in scripture, every time we say, I don't believe it, I can't do it, I, will, I, I won't even put forth an effort, Lord, I won't surrender. Whenever we do that, we go deeper into blindness, to scriptural truth, revealed truth, defined truth, quantifiable truth, all right? Let's go beyond that. So we talked about, in an example, how churches are now, and this is many churches, not just Seventh-day Adventist churches, but Christian churches, are actually using a nightclub environment. And so I talked about how people are still going to churches, but they're staying with churches that have now become a glorified worship experience in a nightclub environment. Or it's a nightclub that's been called a church, whichever way you want to go at it, all right? So we shared with you that the whole concept of dark churches, which we are seeing now. In fact, I had someone to send me a, 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 a couple of quick video clips of a recent North, I'm going to just say it because it was out there, and, and let me I'm going to give you what happened as a result of that. The North American Division had a ministerial department uh, gr uh, meeting in Lexington. It was called, it, the name of the event was called and so they had a youth track, and it was nothing but a nightclub environment. It was so challenging that over 100 pastors required, demanded a meeting with the North American Division Administration. However, please understand, we live at a time that because they met with them, don't think that they will have evoked a change. Don't think that their 
requiring a meeting to discuss it is going to have them change their position. In fact, I can almost guarantee you that everyone that was there will become a marked person. Okay, so we talked about that. So let's go on beyond that, all right? And note this, Satan has a bewitching power and justice demands that sin be not merely pardoned, but the death penalty must be executed. God in the gift of his only begotten son met both these requirements by dying in man's stead. Christ exalted, exhausted the penalty and provided a pardon. Man through sin has been severed from the life of God. His soul is palsied through the machinations of Satan, the author of sin. Of himself, this is man, he is incapable of sensing sin. And the reason I want us to, to, to focus on this is, is here's your point. If you go to somebody and you say, well, what's wrong with this? They can't tell you what's wrong with it because they have become blind. And here is the bigger issue is we have to understand that if we're doing anything in the name of God, we have to ask God, what do you ask of me? What do you require of me? What are you expecting of me? What do you require in this context? What is your outline for this context? So we begin in a backwards kind of setting or process where we actually say, well, I think we ought to do this and we ought to have this and we ought to get this band and we ought to have this preaching and that. And then somebody asks the question, well, what would Jesus do? I don't know, man, but I think, you know, we have to flow with the times. And this is, this, this is the times that we're living in. I don't know what Jesus would do, but I remember he spent, and this, I've, I've heard these conversations, folks. And they will say, but, you know, Jesus was always around the poor and the, and the needy. And, and, you know, he hung out with the prostitutes and this kind of thing. And I know that Jesus wouldn't have a problem with this because we're meeting people where they are. You ever heard that? You ever heard that? Okay. Who becomes the standard in that statement? Is God the standard or are they the standard? They are the standard. Okay. And that's the beginning of the problem. So, therefore, therefore, note this. Because man is incapable of sensing sin, I can't trust your judgment. Incapable of appreciating and appropriating the divine nature. So it's not in me to see it and appreciate it. Were it brought within his reach, there is nothing in it that his natural heart would desire it. The bewitching power of Satan is upon him. This is even when we're in Christ. We're confused. We're deeply confused because when we're confronted about the sins and issues in our lives, we don't want to let them go. Am I right? We hold on for what? Dear life. Am I right? All right. All right. So now this, these quotations came from Bible Commentary, Volume 6, 1099. All right. So now let's go beyond that. So we continued in the words of Christ and we move from that to part one of two parts why we need the seal of God, why we need the seal of God. So we study the requirement of the sealing and why it is imperative we, we pursue it. Now, let me say this. No one will be sealed that is not, no, pardon me, no one will go to heaven that's not sealed. And some people had a problem with that statement. And let's understand why. Because it requires total submission and obedience. What is our example in scripture? You know, you want to know what our example in scripture is? It's real simple. Noah and the ark. A whole lot of people knocked on the door when it started raining. Did they really believe in God? No. What was happening at the point that they were knocking on the door? Fear. Fear. The reality set in. They were like, whoa, buddy, it's really raining, okay? I want to get in the ark now. And, and what was the issue then? Too late. Door was what? Closed. And that was a type of sealing of Noah and his wife and their sons and their wives. They were sealed on the inside. Those who refused to enter were not. They were playing the game of seeing whether or not God really meant what he said. Whether there's some good, let's touch on it. Were there some good people who were lost? Huh? Yes. But here's the tougher question. Were they righteous? Okay, there's your difference. There's your difference. And that's why we spent time speaking about that online. 
Good folks. Oh, good people. They were thoughtful. They were helpful. Oh, they came over and helped me mow my lawn. Were they lost? Lost. That's what we have to be careful of, all right? All right, so now we learned that the future that we are going to go through is similar to the ruin of Jerusalem. It's not really symbol. I shouldn't say similar. It is a symbol. What took place at Jerusalem, the destruction of Jerusalem, AD 70, it was a symbol of the final ruin that shall overwhelm the world, and we talked about that. The prophecies that received a partial fulfillment have a more direct application to the last days. All right, so we go beyond that. Now, now is the time for God's people to do what? Show themselves what? True to principle. Okay, now let me ask you this. Can an athlete run in the Olympics that has not been running every day? Can an athlete enter the triathlon that has not been working out every day? Can they wake up one day and say, oh, you know, I think I'll join the triathlon. I, you know what? I'm in pretty good shape. I go to the gym every day. I've never done it before. What is it, what is it, what they, what is it that they do in that? Oh, my, let me Google it. They do that, they do that, and they do that. Psh, I can do that. Well, let me just jump in there, and I'll go down there, and I'll tell them, hey, I'm ready to do this. And they just say, come on, coach. You know I can do it. I mean, look at me. I'm fit. I mean, hey, we can do this. We are not going to meet the standard of heaven when we have not been practicing living the standard of heaven every day. I hope we're really getting to that. Now, that's for all of us. That's me included. But that's for all of us, the standard of heaven. So whatever that is, okay, heaven is not intemperance. Heaven is not a mean-spirited person. Heaven is not an unkind person. Heaven is not a greedy person. Heaven is not a covetous person. I mean, so when we talk about, you know, all of us like to go through the big checklist. Well, oh, I've never done that. And I've not done that. And I ooh, wouldn't think about doing that. And oh, that would never cross my mind. But at the same time, we don't have the mind of heaven. We don't have the mind of heaven. We just saw that. We don't have, we don't have the mind of heaven. Note that. So we have to practice. Note this. This is when true Christianity is revealed in all of us. And listen to the context. When the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, nobody respects it anymore. When his law is most despised, okay? We live at that time. Then should our zeal be the warmest and our courage and firmness the most unflinching. To stand in the defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us. To fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few. This will be our what? Our test. All right. Now, this comes from the book Sons and Daughters of God, page 201. OK, so note what the challenge is. We must gather warmth from the coldness of others. Courage from their cowardice and loyalty from their treason. That's, that's provocative. That's challenging, all right? Now, we worked our way through that message, and we concluded in this regard. Note this, all right? As we near the close of time, the demarcation between the children of light and the children of darkness will become more and more what everybody decided. They will be more and more at what? Variance. They're going to be opposites. And you're not going to be able to split hairs over it. You know, and, and that's why I spent the time that I did last week talking about this business of calling everybody good. And I said, that's where we begin to set up our minds to think that, well, they're good enough to be saved. No, the Bible says righteous. And remember, that's why Abraham used the term, will you save Sodom for 50 Good people, that is not what he said. 50 what? Righteous people, which means they have to be law-abiding, which means that you don't compromise on God's word. So note this. They will be more and more at variance. This difference is expressed in the words of Christ, born again, created new in Christ, dead to the world, and alive unto who, everybody? Unto God, all right? These are the walls of, what's that word? Separation that divide the heavenly 
from the what? The earthly. And describe the difference between those who belong to the world and those who are chosen out of it. Now, that's a powerful statement, all right? It is a knowledge of practical godliness, a daily conversion that is the great need in our world. All right? Now, I want to complete this section. Okay, now, salvation and the seal. Salvation and the seal. So now, today, we are focused on the seal, specifically, and how the seal is a must. Therefore, to have the seal, it must be something that is purposely and conscientiously pursued, right? Now, it's not a prize to be won, but it's a race to be won because all who run the race will not get the same prize because some, remember, are on this road, are on this race, but are not going to stay with it to the end, right? So now let's, let's look at some very important information, all right? Now, in November the 5th, 2019, Kathy Summers Timmons wrote an article, Shaken, Sifted, Settled, and Sealed. You familiar with this article, Sister Shirley? I see you nodding vigorously, all right? I'm going to go through some of the statements that she made. This is a powerful article. She did her homework, and so we extracted some of the information from it. We must understand the moment of time through which we are passing. That means now. Now, I'm going to share this with you. I know that some people feel that there is a tremendous amount of emphasis on the end time from this pulpit. But I have a question for you. How long did Noah preach about the flood? How many years? 120 years. I have not been with you for 120 years yet. Okay? So, 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 you, so you're doing well, Okay? When I get to 120 years, if I keep singing the same song for 120 years, then, okay, then you'll know, okay. But, but until then, we're all right. Listen to this. This will be our last, what kind of chance? Last and what? Only chance to take to heart the Lord's process of doing what? Perfecting character. So we're not made perfect because we accept Christ. Okay, so let me tell you how this works. When you accept Jesus, he appropriates to you a perfect character as if you have already grown to that, as if you've already obtained it, okay? But let's understand something. If you keep walking contrary to that which you have get been given, then he'll say, wait a minute, here's my character and it's straight, but you're crooked. It's upright, but you're low down. I'm sorry. You don't deserve my coat. Give me back my coat. Give me back my robe of righteousness. You are a fake. Okay, remember we discussed that. We touched on it to a degree when we spoke about the scribes and Pharisees. Okay? Those were the individuals that Jesus called. What was the word he used? Sister Tirza said it first. What was the word? Hypocrites. Why did Jesus call them hypocrites? Because they looked like they had it together, but they were what? They were not genuine. Where does the word counterfeit come from? The word counterfeit comes from the idea that something can look genuine. Something can even have a genuine color. But it's the eye of the person that understands the details that can say, this is not a genuine $100 bill. Have you ever gone to the grocery store or even at the, at the gas station and you're paying for it? Now, once upon a time, you dropped a 50 to pay for gas. You felt like, I'm going to get some change back, right? <laughs> okay, you remember that? You re anybody want to go back to those days? Okay, guess what? They're gone, all right? But I just want to I just want to share that with you. I mean, you remember that we would drop a 50 on the counter and then they would say, oh, here's your 20. And you say, I want 30 in the tank. 30 would fill it up. And you pull out and you say, wow, I filled up for $30. All right. Tell me how far $50 will carry you now. 
Okay, now let me, let me share this with you. I'm going I'm to give you perspective. I'm going to give you perspective. And all of us are feeling it. All of us are feeling it. Nobody is exempt. The only way you're exempt is if you're walking or riding the bus, okay, or riding the bus, all right? But I got news for you. This week, my wife and I are working out of one car. My car is finally fixed. I'll pick it up at the top of the week. Amen. But I, <laughs> I put 30... I put thirty. I put thirty-eight dollars in it one day, because it had just moved to about a quarter of a tank. And then yesterday, before the Sabbath, I said, "Sweetheart, we don't have enough fuel to do services tomorrow." And she did not say, "Oh, well, let's put some gas in it." She never said a word. Her head was down, and it never came up. She said, "She said," and then she kind of looked over after a moment. She said, "How much is in it?" And it was down to right about a quarter of a tank. She said, oh, I guess we do. And then she went back to looking down. And I said, OK, so that means I have to buy the gas. Two, two days earlier, two days earlier, three days maybe, I had put $38 in it. Yesterday, I put $61 in it. I, de I declared I was not going to put 62 in there because 62 plus 38 is 100. So I could mentally absorb that I had put $99 in the tank in one week. <laughs> I could not mentally accept that I had put $100 in the tank, okay? I just mentally, that $1 was going to be a deal breaker to my brain, okay? I just was not going there. And I just said, Lord, I'm not doing $100 a week. This is just not, we, we, this is not even realistic. But I literally could have put an extra dollar in there. Let me tell you what was so fascinating. That while I was, you know, pumping the fuel, I kept watching the dollars roll, but nothing was going in the tank. <laughs> have, you, have you been monitoring that now? Okay. And so you just see that the dollars are rolling like this, and then it's like half a gallon, three quarters of a gallon. Okay. And you begin to realize that's really how much you're spending on fuel, okay? That's living in reality. Is that living in reality? Okay, however, some of us don't live in reality about our character. Okay, listen to this. So the Lord wants us to perfect our character, and that is exactly what he wishes us to do. Those who realize that this process has already started and those who truly desire to be a part of God's holy kingdom will enter into the process of, what's the word? Refinement. 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 Now, don't tell me that you don't need refinement because I've got news for you. Do you know, and these classes still exist, they have classes for people to learn proper etiquette. You know that they have classes for that? They do. They do. So you know how to eat properly, right? Like you have all these eating utensils on the table. Have you ever seen a really formal table? Okay. You see a really formal table, you have two and three forks to the left, and you have two two knives to the right, and then you have two spoons, and then, then you have another fork that's laying um, horizontal at the top of the plate. Come on out. In, in, uh, am I with you? And you have like three glasses to, to one side. One's a water glass, one's a drink glass, and one's a whatever glass. Okay, I don't know what, okay. So, all right. And then those that have full service, they may even have a hot drink cup to the side, or sometimes that's served later. Then you have a dinner plate, a salad plate, bread plate. Okay? Are y'all with me? I didn't lose you. I mean, I know that some of us just give me a paper plate and we're good to go. I mean, I understand, I understand that. Okay, I do, I, I do get that. But there is a way, there's a proper way, okay? There's a proper way to dine, okay? If there's a proper way for us to dine, why isn't there a proper way for us to be as Christians? Okay, let's go on beyond this. Why do most Adventists not make this choice of life when they have heard how important it is? How in the world can people allow this last bit of time to escape, knowing that a day of immense trouble is on the horizon? 
That's a question. That's a question from the author, the, the writer. And she's going to give you the answer, okay? Now, I'm letting you take the photos, but I need to press on. All right, here we go. Here's the answer. She gives it to us out of the great controversy, page 622. What does she say? The time of trouble such as never was is soon to open us, open up, open upon us, and we shall need an experience which we do not now possess and which many are too, what? Indolent to obtain. What does indolent mean? Lazy. You're too lazy to obtain it. It is often the case trouble is greater in anticipation than in reality, but this is not true of the crisis before us. The most vivid presentation cannot reach the magnitude of the ordeal, and in that time of trial, every soul must stand for himself. That's herself as well, before God. All right? Why does it say that many would not make it through to the end? Simply because they were too what? Lazy to obtain the experience they needed. What is the experience of which, which Mrs. White speaks, and why are people too lazy? That's a, that's a logical question, right? Listen to this, and this is a deal breaker. This is a, this is a wake up call for everybody. Many of our ministers, many of our who? Okay, not physicians, not teachers, physicians in their discourses dwell too largely upon theory and not on practical godliness. They have an intellectual knowledge of the truth, but their hearts are untouched with the genuine fervor of the love of Christ. Many have gained the knowledge of our publications, a knowledge of the arguments that sustain the truth, but they have not become Bible students for themselves. They are not constantly seeking for a deeper and more thorough knowledge of the plan of salvation as revealed in the scriptures. Practical godliness must be what, everybody? It doesn't come by osmosis. It's not just going to drop in our heads. So what is practical godliness? Practical godliness is the application of Christian principles. That's all it is. And that's the reason the pastor spends so much time on the devotional line giving examples and teaching and drilling and going over and over because if we don't understand how to apply a principle, we might as well not know the principle. That's the reality. Note this. Those who study and practice, practice the teachings of Christ will gain an essential education in Bible knowledge. By the standard of the word of God, every teacher will one day be measured by the greatest teacher this world ever knew. Belief in the, the grand truths he presented will work a reformation in all who truly receive him. Okay, as Seventh Day Adventist Christians, it is our what is the word duty to seek out what truth. Okay, now this is why we spent so much time on the line talking about the pandemic because many people fell in line with whatever the narrative was, and they never asked a question. They never just said, "Why? How come?" What for? No matter what decision you made at the end of the day, you should walk down the street knowingly. How many of you would go in, sign a deal for a home or a car with a loan and not know what the interest rate is? I hope you wouldn't. I mean, I really hope you wouldn't. How many of you would sign a document without knowing that the document can be upheld in the court of law, but it is not some hokey dokey document? But so many times we are so willing to follow what the herd is doing without actually being intelligent about what we're doing. If you make a decision to follow the herd after you know all the information, then so be it. But if you jump and join the herd and you don't know where the herd is going, remember Jesus gave us a principle for that. What is the principle he gives us? He says the blind lead the who? The blind and they both fall where? Into a ditch. Okay, well, there's, there's the end of that. Because how are the blind going to help the blind? So it is incredible for anyone to take the attitude of that individuals who stay in conference churches will be lost. Now, this is not me talking. This is from Kathy Summers Timmons. This is part two of this series, these articles. So 
I didn't write this. So what she is about to say is what you have heard on the devotional line, but I did not say this. She's saying it. It lets you know I'm not the only one saying it. Notice what she says. It is incredible for anyone to take the attitude that individuals who stay in conference churches will be lost for putting up with error and not standing for truth. Now, you got to read this carefully. While at the same time, they're doing the exact same thing in their independent churches. Whoa, buddy, that's a wake up. That's a wake up, okay? Thinking that they have somehow escaped the wrath that they say will fall on the other people. Many are in this state of extreme danger. If they do not recognize the reality of the above principles, they will be surprised to learn too late that they cannot be admitted into God's kingdom. If they switch camps for the right reason but cling to their old ways in the new camps, they will suffer the same end that they were trying to escape by switching in the first place. It's called changing membership with bringing your baggage with you. That's why we, you know, we, we reached a point in our existence as a church where I encourage you, please don't invite anybody to join this church. I still hold to that. You know why? Because if they don't want to be here, inviting them to be here where we're preaching present truth is not going to make them happy here. Don't. Just let them be where they are. Because anybody who wants to be a part of present truth has to want to do what? Change and be in present truth, period. Okay? Note this. We desperately need to understand that the shaking, sifting, settling, and sealing process will continue all until all of us are in one group or the other. There are only going to be two groups, okay? The principles working together in this process fall in line with those stated above. This being the case, as individuals, we must go, what is that term? Step by step, up the path with our eyes firmly on Jesus. Mrs. White's vision clearly shows that when the people took their eyes off Jesus, what happened to them? They fell off of the straight and narrow way. See early writings, pages 14 through 20. Okay? Now, distractions also have an appeal to the unconverted. So if we're always caught up with the distractions of what's happening in the church, if you notice, I don't send a lot of articles to our leaders about what's happening in the church. I send articles of what's happening in the world. Because if the church is sick, you know what condition the world is in. Now, I hope you didn't miss that. If the church is sick, and we know that the church is sick, if the church is sick, you know what condition the world is in. In fact, I was talking to one person not long ago who's in the present truth, and they made the statement to me, and this is a family member, and they made the statement to me, they said, I know we're near the, com the coming of the Lord. I don't need to look at the world. I look at the church, and I know we're near the coming of the Lord. Do you get the distinction? Because the church is in trouble. But also know that it will appear as about to what? Fall, but it does not what? Fall. And I never will forget, Dad always said to me, he said, son, when you see the church in trouble, do one thing, pray, Lord, stay at the wheel. Stay at the wheel. Don't let the church fall into the hands of men. And he said, of course, it's not going to happen. He said, but you want to focus your attention. Lord, stay at the, at the wheel. Note what we have here. This is Maranatha, page 43. We are also plainly told that in this last moment of time, many wonderful and terrible things will be happening, and we will need to keep our eyes wide open. 
and be empowered with the eye salve to discern the events, thereby having wisdom from on high, Revelation 3.18. We are told that in this time, many will come up to one point of faith, draw the line, and go no further, while others will draw the line at a different point. There will be those who are known for their great achievements or knowledge and at one time have shown brightly for the Lord, but for whatever reason, in the end, they will go out into utter darkness. There are far too many who are clearly exhibiting their loyalty to man above their loyalty to Jesus. Is that a serious statement? Okay. Their actions would have us believe that they know who will end up in heaven and who will not. But this is the same foolishness they claim to recognize and others who say the church, meaning the conference, is going through. How vitally important it is that people individually study to understand the process through which we are going to see it is a matter of life and death, as it is certainly, all right? So then we want to conclude with a study of Ephesians 4, which we've already done, but we want to note the emphasis on verses 17 through 24, and let's note what he emphasizes. So let's turn there as we move toward the close. Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, and we want to focus on verses 17 through 24. Note, now I'm going to begin reading. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other who Gentiles walk in the vanity of their what? Mind. Having the understanding, what everybody? Darkened. All right, let's go forward. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the what of their heart? The blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the what everybody, the former conversation, the what everybody, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in what? Righteousness and true holiness. What is righteousness? It's doing what? being law-abiding, all right? Note this, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which after God has created in righteousness and true holiness. Note what this word means, piety, holiness or truth. The sanctification of the soul is accomplished through steadfastly beholding him, Christ, by faith, as the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. The power of truth is to transform what, everybody? Heart and character. Its effect is not like a dash of color here and there upon the canvas. The whole character is to be what? Transformed. The image of Christ is to be what? Revealed in what? Words and actions. Anybody got growing to do based upon that definition? I do. All right, listen to this. A new nature is imparted. Man is renewed after the image of Christ in righteousness and true holiness. The grace of Christ is essential. How often, everyone? Every day. And how often every day? Every hour. Unless it is with us continually, the inconsistencies of the natural heart will appear and the life will present a what? Divided service. The character is to be full of grace and truth. Wherever the religion of Christ works, it will brighten and sweeten every detail of life with more than an earthly joy and a higher than earthly peace. We are counseled to let no, what, read this with me, no what? Corrupt communication proceed out of our mouth. But a corrupt communication is not simply something that is vile and vulgar. It is any communication that will eclipse from the mind the view of Jesus, that will blot from the soul true sympathy and love. It is a communication in which the love of Christ is not what? Expressed, but rather sentiments of an unchrist like character. The peace that dwells in the soul is seen on the countenance. The peace that dwells in the soul is seen where, everybody? 
on the countenance. How many times has the pastor come in church and I said, are we happy today? Okay, what am I pursuing? I'm pursuing for your face to reflect. If you really have peace, joy, and happiness in Jesus, what am I really saying? Show it. Express it. Nobody should have to appeal for it. If you are content, happy, and joyful in Jesus, we ought to see your teeth. Amen. Okay? All right. Listen to this. The words and actions express the love of the Savior. There's no striving for the highest place. Self is renounced. The name of Jesus is written on all that is said and done. We may talk of the blessings of the Holy Spirit, but unless we prepare ourselves for his reception, you know, we've been talking about praying for the Holy Spirit. You can talk about praying for the Holy Spirit all you want to, but unless you are preparing the heart to receive it, you will not receive him. Are we striving with all our power to attain the stature of men and women in Christ? Are we seeking for his fullness, ever pressing toward the mark set before us, the perfection of his character? When the Lord's people reach this mark, they will be what? Sealed in their foreheads. Filled with the what? Come on now, let's read this together because we're closing. Filled with the what? They will be what? Complete Christ. And the recording angel will declare on our lives what? It is finished. So it's in our ability to make the decision for Christ to change us. We can't change ourselves. But we can every time the Holy Spirit convicts us. Now, was that the right thing to say? Is that the right thing to do? I made a statement this week. I'll just pick on this one. Okay, just give you, give you myself as an example. I was talking to Sister Stepney. Timing is everything. I was talking to Sister Stepney, and I made a statement that I realized was not articulated the best as I was describing something. And I hung up the phone, and she and I had been talking for quite a while. I think when I looked at the phone, I think we had talked about an hour, okay? But do you know the Holy Spirit wore my head out? And he said, now you know that that was not the best way to articulate that. And I said, that's true, Lord. It wasn't. He said, then you need to fix it. And we were just talking in general terms. This was not, I wasn't speaking about her. She wasn't speaking about me. We were talking about issues. But the way I spoke about the issue was not with the words of Christ. I picked up the phone. I went back down the hall. I would walk out of the room. I'd walk down the hall. I was headed out of the house. I walked back down the hall, picked up the phone, called her back. And I said, to Sister Stephanie, I need to revisit a statement I just made. And so I walked her right back through what I had said. I said, this is what I should have said. She said, oh, I understood. Now, she's being forgiving. But that's not what's important because she's not the one who has the keys to the kingdom. I needed to make sure that the Holy Spirit was putting his stamp on my words. And because he had convicted me that he could not, then I needed to go and restructure the words so that he could. That's just one example. That's just one example of responding to the Holy Spirit as soon as he convicts us in our hearts, you need to do this. You need to not do that. And so today, my brothers and sisters, I want to challenge you in this reality. That all of us have growth points. We all have growth points in our character. Do we have growth points? We all have growth points. And the only thing we can do to receive the sealing is to follow 
the prescription. As the Holy Spirit convicts us, say, I surrender. That's all. I surrender. So if the Lord tells you that you talk too much, I surrender. If the Lord tells you that you eat too much, I surrender. If the Lord tells you that you spend too much, I surrender. If the Lord tells you that you sit at the house too much, you're not doing any witnessing, I surrender. And then purpose to do differently. Ask for the Holy Spirit to change your speech, your desire to spend money all the time, your need to always go, go, go. Some of us have that, that issue. I mean, we're always in flight. We're burning gas and don't even know where we're going. And we do that, we're, we, we're hooked on that, that adrenaline rush of just always being in motion. And the Lord says, wait a minute, I want you to come over here, sit down, and spend some time with me. And we can't get to that if we're always in motion. So whatever the issue is, whatever the issue is, and there's no way that I can list all the issues because the issues are our issues. And the Lord wants to talk to us. And you have to let him. So let's close with a prayer of commitment. Let's go to our knees. Gracious Lord, we thank you for the privilege of learning, growing. Now we ask that you would give us the joy of conquering because we want to fulfill that passage that we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. So, Lord, may we, in the battle that we face every day, conquer self by the strength and power of the Holy Spirit as sent through Jesus our Savior in accordance with the defined outline in your word. May our lives come in harmony and total surrender to our Savior. We want to be sealed, and we ask, Lord, that you will do whatever is necessary to help us to be sealed and to seal us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen and amen.